It's not unusual for members of the Vancouver Island Marmot Recovery Team to see the sunrise from a mountaintop. This morning, we're heading to the Haley Lake Ecological Reserve. After driving on logging roads for an hour, there's a 30-minute climb to the top of a ridge. On the other side lies a subalpine meadow. Let's take a look. All right, we got babies. We got babies. Okay, that's live wire burrow. I can count three. Ah, oh, this is great. Oh man, this site needed it. But to get near them, Andrew and his assistant Jason Lewis have to make their way down this hillside. <laughs> it's a 30 degree incline. One slip could mean trouble. And this is one of the easier colonies to get to. After two hours of driving and hiking, Andrew and Jason are finally in place to get a glimpse of the Haley Lake Marmot Colony. Marmots breed in the spring and the babies emerge a couple of months later. Marmots are very social animals that rarely display aggressive behavior. Man isn't recognized as a predator, so people can get very close. So close it's hard to remember these are wild animals. For instance, Here's mom sitting close by, watching calmly as her babies investigate the cameraman. One of the really fun things about Vancouver Island marmots is, is how approachable they are. Um, they're pretty tame. They don't seem to mind people very much. And, um, and they don't seem to mind other marmots very much. They're, uh, they're not very territorial. You don't often see fights happening or, or antagonistic behavior. And, and the interesting thing about all of this is that Marmots are really highly social creatures, and the reason why they're highly social creatures is directly related to this habitat. The whole evolutionary history of Vancouver Island marmots is, is, is based on this, this fundamental need for these, these spots that are clear of trees, but also have lots of, lots of things to eat and, uh, and good soil for digging burrows in. Uh, the natural habitat out here is, is um, fairly small and it's also patchily distributed. These subalpine meadows typically are quite small, you know, several hectares in size, and they're, um, they're, they're, they're scattered quite widely. So you, you have a patch of meadow habitat on one mountain and on the next mountain you may have another patch of habitat. Uh, scientists actually call fragmented populations like this a metapopulation. A metapopulation is just a, a scientific buzzword that means a population of populations. When you have these small colonies, it's all too easy to imagine how they can become extinct. Um, a bad winter, uh, a cougar that comes in and kills the breeding female, or a bald eagle that, that comes in and kills the breeding male, um, can cause local extinction. Now, marmots have, have faced this lifestyle for many, many um, centuries, and they're, they're quite adapted to it. Uh, but the whole key to understanding Vancouver Island marmots is to understand that naturally these small colonies become extinct and, that, and are then recolonized by dispersing marmots. And in fact, Vancouver Island marmots are programmed to disperse. Most of the, the young marmots uh, will disperse at age two or three. I like to take people to this spot because this also is a, is a good place to talk about marmot dispersal because it's one of the few places where we actually have some empirical evidence. Um, on the east side of Mount Wimper, for example, um, I have a, a clear cut, a logged colony, um, where uh, some years ago we, ha we had probably 25 or 30 animals living there. And two of my tagged animals actually made a, what I consider to be quite a, a stupendous journey for a, for a, for a small rodent. Uh, they literally climbed down out of Pat Lake Basin. They dropped about a thousand meters in elevation, swam across the Chimanus River, traveled up through this young, young forest that was logged probably 30 years ago, up through the, the recent clear cutting uh, on Mount Franklin. And they actually both wound up on the, on the south face of Mount Franklin where they formed a new colony. Being out in the mountains and, and counting marmots on mountaintops is not enough. Um, we have to actually learn how individual animals perform in terms of how well they reproduce, um, how well they survive. So in order to do this, we have to track individual marmots. The only way to do that is catching them. And you're tagging them and basically going up year after year and, 
and seeing it, seeing who's mating with whom and and uh, who survived and who hasn't. Trapping marmots is a, a lot of fun. It's not easy. Uh, on average, I I catch one marmot every two or three days of trapping effort. Um, traps that we use are are these have a heart standard raccoon sized uh, wire mesh traps, and we uh, we bait them with peanut butter. In fact, uh, I tell people that, and it's true, that these marmots seem to have a particular predilection for uh, Skippy Super Chunk. In recent years, marmots have started colonizing open areas created by logging. These clear cuts are below their traditional habitat. Data collected by the team indicates that survival rates in these clear cut colonies isn't as good as it is higher up in the subalpine, traditional marmot habitat. Less snow cover at the lower elevations could be one of the reasons fewer marmots here survive the winter hibernation. Also, as the trees start growing again, the marmots may be more vulnerable to predators because they aren't able to see danger coming. This colony, known as F-19, has young animals that are untagged. We have a minimum of four yearlings here that are untagged and four animals that are, are tagged. Our primary purpose today is to see if we can get a get tags on a couple of additional yearlings. And in fact, these animals are candidates for movement back to Toronto as part of the captive breeding program. So let's keep our fingers crossed. A key part of the rescue plan is the creation of a captive breeding program at the Toronto Zoo. Trapping and tagging take on a special significance now as the team prepares to capture animals for the trip to Ontario. They are concentrating on three colonies. First, they want to tag as many of the animals as possible. Then, by simply checking an ear tag, the animal's identity can be quickly established. The marmot's sex, age, and transplant potential are recorded. This extra work now will reduce the handling of the marmots being shipped to Toronto and minimize stress on the animals. Our trapping protocol is pretty different from other wildlife research projects. We um, we won't trap an animal unless we're right there watching the trap. Uh, we use a very careful uh, drug protocol uh, involving a, a, a very small dose rate. We try to be as careful as possible uh, when handling or processing the animals. These guys, after all, are endangered. I'm pretty f proud of the fact that, that in, in the last 10 years, we've made well over 300 captures with only one single trapping mortality. Uh, so we try and handle the animals carefully. Our, our tagging regime, our handling regime, our drug well, like protocol uh, has been pretty carefully thought out. Okay, so we got two clean tags. 14.6 forearm. Hind foot, 9.4. Perfect immobilization. So same thing always applies, JC. If you're uncomfortable at any point during this procedure, let her go. The idea behind the Toronto Zoo-based program is, uh, is essentially that of a research project. We want to learn how to maintain marmots in captivity, how to breed them. Um, we want to learn good things about nutrition and hibernation and those kinds of questions. Ultimately, the target is to uh, construct a dedicated captive breeding facility for Vancouver Island marmots on Vancouver Island and, uh, and ultimately to mass produce animals for release. Just 31.8. Okay, we're done the measurements. We got an accurate sex. We got good tags. So now we Ultimately, one of the greatest challenges that the recovery team faces is this long-term perspective. People like quick fixes. People like simple answers. Marmots provide neither. Uh, ultimately, the greatest challenge that we face is trying to build the level of public support and funding that will allow us to push forward something that's going to take 10 or 15 years to accomplish.
early August of 1997, the recovery team successfully captured and moved six marmots to the Toronto Zoo. They sent two females and four males of varying ages. Nobody works on an animal for, uh, for 10 or 11 years, as I have, without becoming inordinately fond of them as individuals. A lot of those animals out there I know very, very well. Um, I know, if you will, quite personally. And it, uh, to be honest, it breaks my heart. Every time I have to catch one, every time I have to uh, immobilize one with drugs, um, every time I have to disrupt their natural lifestyle. Okay. For me, the idea of having Vancouver Island marmots in a cage in Toronto Zoo is not pleasant. Um, you swallow your pride, you swallow your feelings, and you hope ultimately that what you're doing is in the best interest, not of those individual animals, but in the species as a whole. This documentary was filmed in the summer of 97. At that time, it was estimated there were 150 adult Vancouver Island marmots in the wild. Only 100 marmots survived the winter of 98, and only 20 of those were breeding females. The Haley Lake colony did not survive. <laughs>